if someone, let's say they are listening and they've tested their total testosterone and they're at 350, let's say, but they feel pretty good. But then been hearing about, about TRT, their buddies have jumped on it and they think maybe I should jump on and take a dose and take my 350 up to 700. That's probably something that you get asked a lot. Happens every day. Right. So what's your advice for that person? Like, what are you thinking about here? Yeah, it's tough because I tell them, do you feel good? You don't have any of the symptoms. Why would you want to do this? You know, and remember that TRT is just supposed to make you normal. Like, you know, it's not going to give you these Arnold Schwarzenegger style gains. And I also remind them that everybody's different. We have, we have really individual differences, mainly probably in the androgen receptor. So we talked about earlier, or maybe we didn't, testosterone in order to work needs to bind to a receptor. Um, all hormones are this way. So you have your, your receptor and you have your ligand. Testosterone in this case is the ligand, it just is the hormone. So it binds to that receptor and the hormone does not work until it's bound. So if you have, that's the point of the free testosterone is since it's not binding to a receptor, it's inert essentially. So after you've, you've bound to that receptor, you can exert all the benefits of testosterone, but we have individual differences in the amount of androgen receptors that we have first. So some people have more androgen receptors than others and men, a lot of our androgen receptors are in our upper body. It's kind of a way that we kind of differentiate natty or not. Sometimes you can look at fake natties and they've got huge delts, huge traps, and their legs are all skinny. You know, there was a, a prominent carnivore guy who kind of fit that phenotype of very jacked upper red traps and everything. And then his legs are kind of skinny and it's like, oh yeah, he's probably on androgens. Um, but we won't to- name him. I, I think, <laughs> I think he, he had King, King in his yeah, name. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the Johnsons. I don't know. Um, but yeah, those, so the androgen receptor is where all the, the effects come and we have genetic differences in there. And it, also, we're finding more and more of the sensitivity to the androgen. So we have these polynucleotides, and it's really complex in the biochemistry and genetics, but there's these things called CAG or CAG repeats that are associated with androgen receptors. And the more of these CAG repeats you have, the less sensitive your androgen receptor is to testosterone. So there's a disease called Kennedy's disease, or I think they call it spinal, spinal bulbar muscular atrophy these days. Uh, I learned it as Kennedy's disease, but these people are very insensitive to androgens. They have low amounts of muscle, so they need more testosterone to exert the same effect. Conversely, the Ronnie Coleman's, Chris Bumsteads of the world probably have very small amount of CAG repeats, and they are very sensitive. Right, so, so if you have two people uh, who have low libido, low energy, but they have different androgen sensitivity, one of them may need a higher dose of, of testosterone replacement therapy. Exactly, and that's why you don't want the cookie cutter too, because you don't want to be told 100 is enough for you when you don't have any symptom relief on 100, you don't get it until 200. Uh, or you don't want to be told that you need 100 when you're getting all of your symptom relief from 70, because now 100 is driving the sympathetic overdrive or gynecomastia or acne or high blood pressure, you know? So it's very nuanced and very individual. Yeah, that's... That's going to be really interesting for people to hear because uh, I think most, at least listeners of this show, have heard guests talk about insulin sensitivity. Mm-hmm. You know, the abil- insulin's a hormone. Yeah. So, like, uh, the ability for insulin to kind of work, do its job, and help get glucose into cells pri- as its sort of primary role. This idea of androgen sensitivity is super interesting. Yeah. Is it genetically determined or are... Are there things that we can do in our lifestyle to change how sensitive we are to these sex hormones? I've never thought of that. I think about androgen receptor sensitivity all the time. And I've never thought, just when you were talking, a light bulb went off. Like, I wonder if there's lifestyle effects just similar to uh, insulin receptors that you know, will degrade the receptor or, or drive some, some, uh, resistance to the androgen. I don't know. I don't think we have a good answer for that right now. It seems to be genetic differences in those polynucleotides like the CAG. And there's some other ones out there too. And then there's differences with the, so the, the, the androgen binds to the receptor in the, the cell, and then that gets translocated into the nucleus. Some people have genetic differences in the translocation. Some people have genetic differences in the transcription translation. So the, the making of the, the DNA into a protein. So there's all of these genetic differences that you need to take into account. So not everyone needs testosterone if they're at a 300 and not everyone doesn't need testosterone if they're at a 700, you know, it's all different. When you walk into a a HRT clinic and you get prescribed testosterone, that testosterone, at least how I see it described on websites, is 
called bioidentical? Mm -hmm. Is that so? Is it synthetic? Is it kind of made in a laboratory? And is it different to what you might buy on the streets or in the gym? It is made and it's made, uh, this one's going to be good for your listeners, usually made from soy, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> soy boys out there, you know, all these guys on TRT are actually soy boys, either soy wow. or yam, but also, you know, a more plant-based food. Um, so they use, <laughs> they use these plants in order to make the, the That's molecule. amazing. Yeah. Um, so it, it's made, but it is bioidentical. So it's, you know, chemically identical to the hormone that you would produce. And then it's attached to an ester. Um, the ester is something that kind of dictates the half-life. So it slowly releases because your body has these esterases that cleave it off. And so if you just did pure testosterone, you know, you'd be hit with a, a boost of testosterone. That's called testosterone suspension. Bodybuilders use it. Powerlifters use it. They do a shot and go hit a lift. Uh, but you actually want a slower release of this stuff. So you usually get testosterone cypionate, which is an ester, or enanthate, which is an ester, or propionate, a different ester. And they all dictate how long it will take to break down and get into circulation. Right. So it's... It's not natural, which poses a problem to someone who kind of whose motto oh. is is yeah. you know natural is best, like the ancestral way of living. I can see people thinking, "Hmm, is taking an exogenous testosterone that's synthetic is that is that natural?" Not that I buy into that yeah. argument, but I can see that kind of might pose a dilemma to some people. It could be, yeah. They usually don't care when it comes to testosterone. Everybody wants testosterone. That's an exception. Yeah, that it's definitely an exception. Like, you know, guys will tell me all the time, like, I don't want medication, and I go, "Oh, okay, good." So we won't talk about testosterone because that's made by a pharmaceutical company. No, 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 no. That's okay. That's what I'm like, okay. Well, you have a large fallacy here. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that's funny about uh, soy being used to just kind of produce the testosterone uh, or at least i found it funny paul saladino put up a, <laughs> a video someone asked him to substantiate his claim that soy is feminizing mm -hmm. and he put up a, a a rat study and i know this intricately because i had to read it like five times i couldn't believe it he, he put he flashed up a rat study on on screen and said you know these rats were fed soy isoflavones uh -huh. and um, it showed that it lowers uh, hormones. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, in that study, it specifically stated that, and I'm not by any means using this study to say that soy raises testosterone. I don't even think this is good evidence. Right. But his study refuted his position. Yeah. That study showed that the, the rats that were exposed to soy isoflavones had an increase in testosterone. Right. Actually, you know, when, when I talked about serums before, there's some thought that these isoflavones can act as a serum, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So they do look like estrogen enough to fit into the receptor. And if it modulates and, and blocks the estrogen, then maybe that causes an increase in testosterone. So there is some, I mean, when you look at data like that, you know, foods, nutrition, it's all over the place. We've talked about before, you can make your, your, uh, your claim on sure. research, you know, if you yeah. search for it. What study are you going to choose today? Right. But, and what studies will you ignore? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it does seem like soy actually has some anabolic effect potentially through increasing testosterone, possibly through that serum mechanism. That's ironic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, straight testosterone versus the testosterone that you would get at a HRT clinic. How do they vary, if at all? So they shouldn't really vary. The, the compound should be the same. Most, the issue with the street is that you never know what you're getting. I mean, like any other drug on the street, you know, you never really know what you're getting unless there's regulation behind it, you know, coming through a pharmacy that's governed and, and regulated by the, the governments. Um, so the issue is a lot of times, you know, a guy is cooking it in his bathroom or his kitchen, you know, using the pots that he cooks macaroni and cheese in and it's dirty and contaminated. It can also have other solvents in there because you have to turn this, this powder into an oil and you it takes certain solvents for that. So sometimes they're highly inflammatory. So purity is the big one. They're usually actually overdose, not underdose because the raws come from China. They're relatively cheap. And the way the underground market works is it's all kind of word of mouth on forums. And occasionally a guy will get his blood drawn on this source's testosterone and they always want it to come back very high. So they always usually overdose a little bit so that when the guy gets tested and posts his results on Reddit, that he's like, oh man, this stuff's good. Look how high it's right. getting my testosterone. It's marketing. 
Yeah. So oftentimes I, I do get the occasional, you know, 45 year old guy who comes to me like, Hey, I couldn't afford TRT. So I went on this stuff and his, his testosterone's through the roof and he doesn't think he's not doing that purposely, you know? So your risk is probably overdosing, but also purity is a big one. That's what I'd be most afraid of. So, you know, what kind of oil are you getting? Are they these inflammatory oils and solvents? And is it actually clean and sterile? Because you're literally injecting this into your body. You can have infections, abscesses, et cetera. Yeah. So that's the biggest concern with it. Can you test it? You can. There's labs. I mean, if that's, it can be expensive, you know, you have mm. to send it usually to a university or there is purity oh. testing labs. Mm. And, and then, then you're going to have to do every batch. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's tough. It's tough to do the product control mm. on that. What if someone is just kind of averse to, ha to having injections? There's is, there, is there other format? To yeah, there's a cream and a gel. Gel came first transition into a cream by compounding pharmacies. The cream's a little superior. There's pellets, which I'm not a huge fan of, but that's pretty common popular these days. They make a little incision in you, stuff a pellet in there, sew you up. And the idea is that it slowly dissolves out. Um, uh, so it more like mimics that natural production? Is that maybe, what it's meant to do? Maybe, but it's meant to do that, yeah. But what we usually see is it causes a large spike too. So sometimes these guys start out like 3,000 nanograms per deciliter, and then they slowly titrate off. And it's usually kind of a robust hit at first. And then there's no way of really controlling it. You got to kind of bank on the body's metabolism of it. So there's pellets, but I don't usually suggest those. Also in guys, a lot of us have pretty lean butts, and they're kind of putting them in the button hip, and it gets painful. So there's not a lot of extra adipose there. Um, there's also now an intranasal testosterone spray. Um, can't remember the dosing protocol. It's either twice or upwards of four times a day that you need to dose this. So it doesn't seem like very practical for most people to remember to be you know, nasally inhaling testosterone. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless. And there's an oral form as well, testosterone undecinate. Is there like site specific increases in in muscle size with injections? It's a good question. Largely debated in the bro forums for sure. Probably not, but maybe in a way, probably more in my opinion via just increasing surface area because you're injecting an oil in there and it can kind of be a site enhancing oil. Uh, and also inflammation because you know, you're injecting that area, there are gonna be immune cells that come to the area because it's a foreign invader and cause it to be a little more inflamed. So in my steroid days for sure, my delts were so much bigger because I was injecting and they were like you know, blown out and it was kind of like a site enhancement. But I don't think I got more muscle. You know, I think that it was just inflamed temporarily. Yeah.